بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would initiate greetings with others with salam that he met he was amiable with his companions and would notice their absence and inquire about them if someone fell ill he alayhi salatu was salam would visit them if someone was absent he would supplicate for them and if someone passed away he would recite upon them inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un which he then followed up by supplicating for him if he feared that someone was troubled by something he sallallahu alayhi wasallam would approach him even if it meant going to his residence he sallallahu alayhi wasallam would frequent the gardens of his companions and accept their hospitality he had close relations with the noble and would honor the virtuous and he would not turn away from anyone nor treat them coldly he would accept the excuses which people gave him and the weak and strong had equal rights in his eyes alayhi salatu wasallam he would not allow anyone to walk behind him saying instead leave the area behind me for the angels neither would he alayhi salatu wasallam allow anyone to walk beside him whilst he rode on a mount without insisting that they mount it alongside him and if the person refused the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would say walk in front of me until you reach where you are going servants tended to the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he had slaves and slave girls to whom he would show no haughtiness in relation to food drink or clothing and as the allah ta'ala who said i served the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for 10 years but allah whenever i accompanied him at home or on a journey to tend to his needs i found that his tending to me was greater than my tending to him so even though anas the allah ta'ala saying even though i was his servant alayhi salatu wasallam the prophet sallallahu would be more attentive towards me than i would be towards the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he never once said uff to me nor did he ever say in regards to something that i had done why did you do this or regarding something that i had not done if only you had done this so haughtiness and anger was very far the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't even question when something wasn't done or when something was done that wasn't supposed to be once the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was on a journey when he ordered that a sheep be slaughtered a man said I take the responsibility for its slaughter. Another remarked, "I will skin it." One another said, "I will cook it." The Holy Prophet sallallahu said, "I will then gather the firewood." The companions replied, "O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we are sufficient." The Prophet sallallahu responded, "I know that you are sufficient. However, I dislike receiving pre- preferential treatment. Indeed, Allah Most High, blessed is He, dislikes that His servant is given preferential treatment between His companions." The Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then went and collected the firewood himself. On another occasion the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was on a journey when he stopped to perform the prayer. Suddenly he turned and some he returned. Someone reco- inquired, "O Messenger of Allah, where are you going?" He said, "I'm going to tie my camel." They said, "O Messenger of Allah, we will tie it for you." He responded, "None of you should take unnecessary assistance from anyone, even if it be to soften a miswak, a tooth stick." The Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi was constantly engaged in remembrance of Allah while sitting and standing and if he came to a group he would sit where the gathering ended and he would command others to do the same. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if there was a majlis taking place if there were people that were sat down to talking then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't jump over everybody else to come to the front. When the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw that the majlis ended the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would sit there. even though the sahabas wouldn't then request and insist that the prophet sallallahu come forward and that's very pertinent with the front stuff wars that takes place that some people be they start to think that this is my area my place no 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 when you come to the masjid wherever there is place that is your place so it's not that someone has a right over the others <laughs> and unfortunately that this happens quite a bit quite a bit that when people come to the masjid they they don't think and i've been reading here for x amount of days fine alhamdulillah but someone else has come today someone else has come and people get upset and people are harsh towards others that who how dare you sit in my place there is no my place the the saf is whoever comes and attends there's no hierarchy there's no uh, that someone has paid 500 pounds donation for this musalla and so that musalla is there's no it doesn't work like that it doesn't work like that everybody has 
the right to the masjid. And when you come, and then masajid al-Allah, that the masjid belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we worship Allah, and the masjid itself is something that we have to be careful with, that we don't. Uh, the Prophet would have been more than deserving to walk right to the front of the majlis. But the Prophet never did that. He would stop wherever the majlis ended. He would give all of those sitting with him a share of his attention so that each one would feel that no one was honored more than him. This is a very remarkable characteristic the Prophet had. Extremely remarkable. That each Sahabi, the Sahaba said, each one of us felt we were the most important in front of the Prophet. Each one of us, as individuals, felt that there was no one more important than me in the eyes of the Messenger of Allah. Because the Prophet taught that he, he behaved with everybody that, that made them felt that they were special to the Prophet. He gave them importance. And so everyone in their mind thought, there's no one more important than me in the eyes of the Messenger of Allah. And everyone felt like that. It's very unique. That whether the Prophet was close with someone or wasn't close with someone, the Prophet gave due attention. And that person actually felt that Muhammad he actually he, he, he has attention towards me. He likes me. He wants me to speak to him. And each Sahabi felt like that. If someone came to sit with him, he would not stand until the individual sitting with him did. He only did so if some pressing matter compelled him, in which case he would seek permission to leave. The Holy Prophet would never confront anyone with something they would dislike. He would not reciprocate evil with a similar evil. Instead, he would forgive and overlook. In Surah Al-Karam, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa inna kala ala khulukin adhim." You are on impeccable mannerisms. And so, there is something that is permissible, and there is something of the better way to do it. So, if someone wrongs you, Islamically, al ainu bil ain, there is the concept of uh, retribution in equal amounts. So if someone wrongs you with level one, you are only allowed to take that back with level one. You can't jump from level one to level 100. Okay, that's number one. However, what's preferential and what's better from the eyes of the Sharia is if you're able to go from level, even if he did level one, 100, to go to zero. And so the, the Prophet ﷺ was of that ilk. If someone personally did any injustice to the Prophet ﷺ, he would immediately forgive and overlook. And so the Prophet ﷺ didn't keep um, evil, that concept of someone does wrong to me, then I reciprocate with the same amount, even though it's permissible. So in Sharia, there are things that are permissible, and there's a better way at times to do it. Okay? Or the optimum way to do it. He ﷺ would visit the ill show love for the destitute, sit with them, and attend their funerals. So the Prophet uh, didn't shun people because of their social status. So if someone was considered impoverished and poor, the Prophet would not look down upon them. It, wouldn't, it wasn't that the Prophet would not sit to eat with them or attend their funerals, which was very habitual in those days, that if there was someone who was poor, then the rich would not attend their janazah, their funerals. So the Prophet was taught the complete opposite, irrespective of social status, irrespective of what wealth a person has or possesses. The Prophet would treat everybody with equal respect. He would not scorn the poor due to their poverty, nor would he be awestruck before a king due to his kingdom. Also the opposite. The Prophet was not uh, sort of uh, taken aback by someone's wealth. It didn't matter to the Prophet Had the Prophet wanted, if he so desired, he could have been, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came to the Messenger of Allah and said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has said, if you want the amount of Uhud in gold, we can give it to you in gold. No problem. Meaning, riches we can give you beyond comprehension. The Prophet said, I, I opt to choose uh, to stay without. The Prophet was given, this is a fiqhi discussion, he was given the option of wealth or staying impoverished. He chose, alayhi salatu wasalam, natural, his own disposition, to stay in poverty. I don't want to be of the wealthy. And so even those with wealth, they didn't strike any awe in the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi due to their excessive wealth. He valued blessings irrespective of how trivial, trivial they seemed, and he would never speak ill of any of Allah's blessings. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi we find in the Shamayil, that when the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi he had certain food that he liked and he preferred, and he would eat them and remember Allah. If something was there that he didn't dislike, he wouldn't speak ill of it. He would simply move away. Eat something else, but not speak ill of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Never did he وسلم, point out deficiencies in food. Rather, if he liked it, he would partake of it. Otherwise, he would leave it. Simple. Don't like something, then move away. But to point out the deficiencies, it's not, it's not, it's not from the Sharia. The Holy Prophet was considerate of his neighbors and would honor his guests. He was always smiling and possessed a beautifully joyful demeanor. All of his time was spent for Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal and in matches that were absolutely necessary. Whenever he was presented with a choice between two matches, he would choose the easier of the two. However, if it involved the severing of ties with relations, he alayhi salatu wasalam, would be the furthest from doing so. And this is emphatically stressed in the Sharia of maintaining ties with one's blood relations that is an absolute right in the Sharia with its own fiqh and jurisprudence which we don't have time to go into at the moment. He would mend his shoes and patch his own clothes. I Meaning the Prophet would do the things that concern him himself. He wouldn't send it on to somebody else. He rode a horse, a mule and a donkey. And the reason why it's, it's specified like this is the Prophet wasn't that I have to ride a particular type of mount. Whatever. If I need to get from destination A to B if it's a horse, alhamdulillah. If it's a mule, alhamdulillah. If it's a donkey, which was considered lowly, alhamdulillah. The point is to get from point A to point B, irrespective of how that's done. His servant or someone else would ride behind him. He would wipe the horse's face with his sleeve or the other or the corner of his shawl. The Holy Prophet wasallam liked optimism and disliked inauspish omens. So the Prophet ﷺ has always taught us to be optimistic from a shari'i perspective and with your dealings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-abdu in the Rabb the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Ana in the dhanni abdi that I am as according to my servant's perception of me. And so if you're optimistic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be good towards you. If you're overtly pessimistic, then that may be reciprocated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah won't forgive, my, my sins are too much, etc. No, that's not how it is. We should be optimistic with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, despite me being a sinner, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more forgiving than my sins. Right? If something happened which he liked, he would say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. If something happened which he disliked, he would say, Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. Still remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever food was taken away from him, after he, he had eaten, he would say, Alhamdulillah, illadhi at'amana wa saqana wa awana wa ja'alana muslimin. And there are different, men- different in different books that are mentioned. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would usually sit facing the direction of the Qibla. This is the general practice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he would face the Qibla. He would remember Allah rabbul izzati wal jalal abundantly lengthen his prayer and shorten his khutbah sermon. The Prophet ﷺ did not deliver lengthy, lengthy khutbahs. In a single gathering, he would seek Allah's forgiveness 100 times. And this is the Prophet ﷺ. That in one majlis, he would remember and seek forgiveness from Allah 100 times. When the Holy Prophet ﷺ was performing his prayers, a whistling sound could be heard from his chest, like the whistling of a kettle, due to his crying. The hadith mentions that the Prophet ﷺ would be excessively emotion, uh, filled with emotion during prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ways that this manifested is there was a particular sound that came out of the Prophet. ﷺ. It's almost as if a continuous, you know, when the kettle starts to boil and then there's a whistling sound in those particular kettles, that it's just a continuous sound. So Prophet ﷺ was continuously emotion full with emotion when he was in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said Allah is would fast on Mondays, Thursdays, three days of every month, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, and on the day of Ashura. Very seldom would he fast on Fridays, except if it fell on 13th, the 14th, and 15th. So he wouldn't single out Fridays for fasting. And this is disliked in the Sharia. He would fast the majority of the month of Sha'ban. The month preceding Ramadan, the majority of it, the Prophet ﷺ would fast. And in fact, some narrations indicate that he would fast the entirety of Shaban, every single day. His eyes ﷺ would rest. However, his heart would not sleep in anticipation of the revelation. This is unique to the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ mentions in hadith that even though you see me 
presumably sleeping, my heart is constantly awake and aware because the wahi can come at any point in any in, at any time. And that's why the fuqaha, they mention that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, their sleep would not break their wudu. Their wudu would remain intact. Sleep would not break it because the Prophet Sallallahu would be conscious from another perspective. When he slept, alayhi salatu wasalam, he would breathe and would not snore. If he وسلم, saw something in his dream that he disliked, he would say, Huallahu la sharika la, and there's other things that are mentioned as well. Whenever he retired to bed, he would say, Rabbi khini adabaka yawma tab'athu ibadik, and also the dua, Allahumma bismika mutu ahya. Upon waking, he would say, Alhamdulillahi alladhi ahyana, ba'da ma matana wa ilayhi al-nushur. And that brings an end to the morals uh, and the etiquettes of the Messenger وسلم, throughout his daily life. There's some more chapters, his food, etc. Um, time doesn't permit now. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever we have gone over, whatever we have read, whatever we have discussed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, allow us to develop such love for the Prophet وسلم, that we implement these practices into our own lives, that we try and embody the Prophet وسلم, as greatly and as abundantly as possible. That in anything that we do, how did my Prophet ﷺ do it? And if it's possible, then we try and emulate that. And there are many, many, many accounts of how the Sahaba, they, they were the manifestation of the lovers of the Prophet ﷺ. They truly understood what that meant. And they did things that weren't required, but their love compelled them to do. Certain companions heard that the Prophet ﷺ liked a particular vegetable. They said that that became our favorite vegetable after that day. Just because the Prophet ﷺ liked it. Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ walked a particular way. The Sahabia, they in the Shama'il describe as the Prophet ﷺ. So they, you have an actual picture elucidated in words of how the Prophet ﷺ walked. This could only be done if someone is absolutely infatuated with the person. That you observe the Prophet ﷺ in everything that they did. How the Prophet ﷺ walked and explicit that the Prophet ﷺ would walk without dragging his feet. He would lift his feet completely. The Prophet ﷺ would be as if he was descending a slope. Okay. Humbleness and humility even in his walk. And everything was recorded by the Sahaba Kiram, Ridwan and Tajma'i. And you find anecdotes in the Masha'i from the from the Mashaikh that they used to study this Shama'il. They used to study this uh, understanding of the Prophet and then practice it. Mashaikh would then practice the walk of the Prophet. <laughs> try and walk like that. Because the Prophet walked, walked like that. And this is an Complete infatuation, and that's why you have so many books of Khasais. You have this book, Nurul Uyun, that that brings together this elements of uh, the Prophet ﷺ's life. So we pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Allah give us uh, the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Allah enable us to put into practice um, the different practices of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Be they Sunnah, be they just something that he preferred, and enable us to be true lovers of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah grant us on the tawfiq, whatever we have discussed throughout our lessons in this month of Ramadan, Allah make it way for us on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to put them into practice. Wa akhiru da'wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanallah bihamdi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant, nasaghfiru wa natubu wa jazakum.